<laughs> Hello. Hi, Masa. Hi. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Uh, Can you share your screen? Yeah. Actually. Uh, yeah. yeah. People are starting to rejoin. Maybe let's wait another couple of minutes. All right, we can see your slides, Roberto. Okay. Oops. Wow. And the whole screen. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh -huh. Okay, uh, we are two minutes late over what we promised, so I think it's time to start. Um, the next speaker is Roberto Maiolino. Uh, I'll try to give you a two minutes warning. Okay, let's try to see. <laughs> Okay, uh, hello everyone. So I will uh, um, illustrate some recent results from the Jades and Ghanis surveys, uh, especially in the area of uh, early black holes and pristine systems. Um, just to mention that, uh, to recall that Jades is a combined GTO program uh, combining time from near, near come, near spec, and MIRI. And in this case, in this presentation, I will focus on the near spec MOS uh, observation, which are targeting uh, thousands of galaxies at high redshift. Well, the GANIF survey is the uh, IFS version of the uh, GTO program, which is targeting about 50 galaxies also at high redshift. And the common thing of both programs is that they are going, uh, in many uh, cases, very deep uh, and using uh, a diversity of uh, uh, dispersers, which are particularly useful for the science that I will going to uh, discuss. Uh, so, to make a long story short, uh, in the first uh, few years of JATES and also a few observations of GANIFs, uh, we have uh, obtained a detection of um, about 15 uh, broadline AGNs, so the det primary detection of broad component of H-alpha and H-beta, which uh, essentially allow us to first identify these as accreting black holes, and also through um, standard evaluation estimate their black hole masses, which is, and you see the distribution of black hole masses in the right panel. And uh, we see you can go, we essentially explore all the way from uh, 10 to the 8 down to uh, about a million uh, solar masses, so much lower 
than what explored by previous quasar surveys and actually entry into the regime of uh, uh, called the dark collapse black holes. An interesting thing is that uh, we also explored a variety of accretion rates from most uh, of these black holes accreting at uh, somewhat sub Newton rates, but uh, the uh, small black holes seems to be uh, actually particularly vigorous in accretion and uh, accreting at about Eddington or even super Eddington. And uh, although one should be aware of uh, selection biases here, okay? Now, they, uh, as mentioned earlier today, uh, one important result is that for these uh, galaxies, we can uh, derive not only black hole mass, but estimate the uh, stellar mass. And the, the common result that we and many other surveys are finding is that uh, these black holes tend to be overmassive relative to the stellar mass of the host galaxy relative to the local relation. Uh, and even possibly approaching uh, a black hole similar to the uh, stellar mass. However, keep in mind that all of these uh, Stellar mass estimates are extremely uncertain. They are uncertain generally at these redshifts, but even more when you have uh, an AGN contaminating the, the light that you see. But I think, so well, how much so overmassive uh, uh, they are is still to be as, is very uncertain, but certainly I think it's a solid result that we, as uh, was discussed today, they are above the local relation. And this is uh, what is indeed expected from scenarios of either black, heavy black hole seeds uh, that are the direct collapse of black holes and or uh, super internal accretion, which is envisaged by some uh, scenarios. However, in, uh, in Jates and Ganits, we, um, we have the, also the high resolution dispersers, which allow us to measure the velocity dispersion of the narrow component. And if you have also an information on the size, we can measure the dynamical mass. And you see now that the relation between the black hole mass and the dynamical mass is much closer to the local relation, okay? So uh, actually there is enough mass there, mostly in gas, and in about the right amount, according to local relation, is simply that the stars did not form efficiently enough while the black hole did. Okay, so together with the uh, plot in the previous slide, this is telling us that the black hole at this high redshift doesn't really know about the star formation history in the host galaxy, but does know about the mass assembly. Okay, now if we ignore, the, uh, now if we um, get, uh, only take the information of the um, velocity dispersion, which is the direct, more direct measurement, and uh, so ignoring the, 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 the radius, we can plot these uh, uh, objects in the black hole sigma relation that locally we know is the tightest among all the scaling relation of black holes and therefore considered the most fundamental. And we see now that these black holes actually align with the black hole, with the local black hole sigma uh, relation, most of them at least, okay? So this is telling us that the black hole sigma relation is not only more fundamental, but also is probably a universal relation. And this relation is generally interpreted in terms of uh, black hole mass uh, being connected with the spheroid merging history. And these, uh, so there is the expectation that merging is already at, at work uh, at these early epochs. And indeed we are finding uh, indications of uh, complex profiles of the BLR. And it's uh, also especially thanks to the high resolution uh, uh, dispersers, we find evidence that uh, some of these BLR are composed of two components, and in these the right panels we show only we remove the other components and show only the uh, one of the two components to uh, highlight the significance. And so we interpret these as uh, uh, coming from two uh, separate black holes which are accreting separate within the slit, so separated by less than one kiloparsec, and therefore which are likely in the process of merging. And we have two additional cases and two additional shifted BLR, which could also be merging or recoiled uh, black holes. These are obtained by integrated spectroscopy in the MSA, but in some cases we also have indication of uh, uh, these possible uh, merging black holes through uh, especially uh, offset uh, BLRs, as in this case where the uh, Hannah Hubler is finding this uh, uh, clear evidence for a BLR at Rashi 7.1, which is offset from the uh, primary galaxy. Okay, there is no evidence of uh, BLR at the peak of the uh, oxygen tree. And this could also be a merging black hole where the primary black hole is inactive and only the merging one is active, as expected actually by some uh, simulations. But it could also be a, a black hole which uh, uh, 
just merged and we are seeing the recoil effect. Okay, so this is a very interesting uh, result. As pointed out earlier, these uh, when uh, located on the BPD diagnostics, these AGNs are completely offset from the local uh, diagnostic uh, for the local AGNs and uh, tend to be aligned in the regions of Tapoming Galaxy. So this is the sad news is uh, that indeed the BPTs cannot be easily used for uh, identifying AGNs at this high redshift. And the interpretation probably is that uh, as illustrated by these models, which show uh, AGN neural region models with different metallicity, is that uh, we are seeing the effect of uh, lo uh, lower metallicity at high redshift that is moving the diagnostic ratios for AGNs towards the subforming uh, region. Um, we have also, uh, with, uh, and this is a work provided by Jan Scholz, uh, explored the search for uh, uh, type 2, uh, so narrow line AGNs. In this case, of course, we have to use diagnostics uh, different from the uh, BPTs, essentially high ionization lines and other UV diagnostics. And uh, uh, together with the type 1, uh, we find that at redshift around 4 to 6, uh, about 25% uh, of the galaxies host an AGN, either type 1 or type 2. And this is, as was discussed uh, earlier today, is, uh, has um, important implications. It's much larger than what is expected by the quasar extrapolation. And uh, also, one should take into account that uh, we are limited in sensitivity to probing AGNs, which are more luminous than 10 to 44, which is still uh, consistent luminosity. If we could have the, uh, the chance to go even fainter, probably the fraction of AGNs would increase even higher. And I'll show, illustrate later that there might be this possibility of exploring even fainter AGNs. Um, uh, I'll uh, con conclude by um, discussing the case of GNZ11, which is actually the most distance of these AGNs that, uh, at about uh, 440 mega years after Big Bang. And this, uh, as uh, illustrated by others, has a fantastic spectrum with uh, uh, a lot of nebular emission lines detected, which allow us to, to do uh, detailed physics at such uh, early epochs. Uh, just a little bit of background on JZ11. This is the most luminous galaxy at redshift higher than 10 in all HST deep fields, including candles and frontier fields, okay? And uh, its luminosity is, has been challenging to explain by uh, various models, if only powered by uh, star formation. And uh, the, the, the explanation is that it's not only powered by star formation, but also it contains a, bright, a relatively luminous AGN. And the most compelling evidence of these are these uh, um, lines, and doublet and multiplet of the uh, nitrogen uh, transitions, which are uh, great because uh, their internal ratio uh, doesn't depend on ionization parameter, doesn't depend on shape of ion as you continue, doesn't depend on chemical enrichment, it only depends on density because these have different critical density. In particular, the non-detection of this blue component of this nitrogen-4 doublet, which has a critical density of 10 to the 4, 5, indicates that, as you see on the right panel, the density of this gas must be higher than 10 to the 6, which is much higher than any uh, ionized region in any galaxy known in, uh, so far, except for the BLR of AGNs. Similarly, this uh, reddest uh, component of this uh, 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 nitrogen tree uh, multiplet is uh, uh, being so strong, uh, uh, it is, has the highest de uh, critical density of above 10 to the, uh, about 10 to the 10 uh, particular cubic centimeters, indicates that the density of the gas must be actually higher than 10 to the 10. So, well, first, I want to emphasize again that it is fantastic that we are able to do detailed atomic physics 400 years after Big Bang. But uh, the main uh, result here is that essentially this gas must be coming from gas which is ultra dense, not typical uh, certainly of the ISM in galaxies, but typically found in the broader regions of AGNs. And the only reason why this uh, GNZ11 was not promptly identified as uh, a type 1 AGN is because there it's uh, uh, broken are, are actually relatively narrow, so it's actually a narrow line safer to one. Uh, and uh, uh, there are also other indications of uh, DGNs, such as AGN-like uh, transitions. There is evidence for uh, uh, high-speed uh, uh, wind, uh, typical of AGNs, uh, indicated that the AGN feedback is already at work by redshift 10. So the mass that we infer for the, the black hole in JZ11 is uh, about uh, um, a million solar masses. 
is accreting at a, a super Edison rate, which is similar to what is found for another one, say for one in the local universe, and can be explained in uh, various scenarios uh, with heavy seeds uh, or even super Edison accretion, sporadic uh, accretion. Um, I conclude that uh, saying that uh, we have high spectroscopy also of Gen Z11. We detected a fantastic uh, Laman alpha hail, which was not expected because the uh, dim, cosmological dimming of the surface density, of, which goes as 1 plus z to the 4, wouldn't have allowed us to detect this uh, normal Laman alpha halo. But uh, this is consistent with the fact that the game is uh, powered this uh, halo by the, the AGN in Gen Z11. An interesting additional result is that we are detecting uh, um, emission from helium 2 uh, in the halo of Gen Z11 without any other uh, emission line and a uh, metal line. And these uh, could be a signature actual of population tree in the halo of these uh, primary galaxies, which is actually predicted at this uh, level by uh, some simulations. I land by only advertising this uh, large upcoming program, uh, PI'd by Daniel Eisenstein and, um, and myself, and copied myself, and uh, essentially which uh, will provide uh, a very deep exposure and medium wide filters for finding very high energy galaxies, but at the same time, in parallel, we'll provide ultra deep spectroscopy with up to about 50 hours in uh, PRISM and uh, the um, great deep spectroscopy, which uh, will hopefully, as I mentioned, uh, was hinting, will allow us to detect even fainter and uh, lower luminosity AGS and black in their calls in the early universe. And uh, thank you, I'll leave it the conclusion for, uh, uh, for you. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. There any questions? Just looking at these first two conclusions, I guess the implication is that the sigma m star relation would be problematic or different at high redshifts. Then uh, could be well. Essentially, what happens is that uh, the you have a, uh, what is actually not unexpected is that uh, the gas fraction is very high. Okay, and so sigma is proving mostly the dynamical mass equitation potential, and so uh, as we it was discussed discussed also by other um, uh, speakers, essentially you have, these systems have been relatively inefficient in forming stars. Yet there is still a lot of gas mass which has not been yet converted into stars. But black holes somehow find its way to actually accrete relatively uh, quickly. Is another possibility that you're just missing some of the light of the galaxies because it's too faint because of the surface brightness dimming effect? Could be, could be, I mean, could be. As I said, the, 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 you just yeah, lose uh, the outer parts of the galaxy. Yes. Well, these are some of the. Um, could be. Yes, that's a possibility. Um, I must say that some of these hosts are in some of the deepest exposures that we have in near come. Okay. So it's um, it's uh, it's uh, probably unlikely in those cases that we are missing much light, but uh, that could be a possibility. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, I must say that uh, again, once again, these uh, stellar, uh, stellar masses are again uh, very uncertain. You can see from some of these uh, uh, error bars, uh, depending on the assumptions that you uh, put in terms of. Uh, uh, Slope of the intrinsic of the agents and reddening of the agents, the external mass that you derive can be uh, different by even an order of magnitude. Okay. Hi, Roberto. Thanks for a great talk. I'm a clown from University of Florida. So, you mentioned there's indications of early black hole merging. I was wondering if that has any implications on the possibility of uh, relaxing some of the constraints on super Eddington and Eddington accretion requirements because uh, some of the black mm. holes can boost their black hole growth through mergers and not yeah. have as much okay, needed yeah. growth due to accretion. Uh, yes, could be. I, I don't, I, honestly, uh, I, I don't know yet. Could be. Uh, uh, I doubt because uh, still uh, merging uh, has to happen too uh, quickly in order to uh, contribute uh, to most of the mass of the black hole. Okay, they probably contribute, but not that much. However, I must say that uh, when we found these results, uh, the um, people, uh, theoreticians, and the doing, people doing cosmological were taken uh, by surprise because they didn't have ready 
simulations to predict the merging rate of these small black holes uh, and within these small um, uh, distances uh, uh, ready to compare and this high rate shift also ready to compare with our results. So they are working now on this, but uh, we don't have a direct comparison with what was what is expected by the theoretical models. So it will come soon. Okay. I didn't see okay. here. So. Okay, we need to thank Roberto again. Thank you. And uh, the next speaker is, is Minghao Yu. Hello. Okay, can you hear me? Great. Uh, so hello everyone, I'm Minghao Yu and I'm a postdoc from MIT Kavli Institute. So today, uh, I'm very excited to get this chance to talk about some recent results from the Iger project about high redshift, well, redshift six with our host galaxies. Uh, well, I would like to say a big thank you to the conference organizers to give me this opportunity, as well as to everybody who has been working on GWST to make, really make this uh, fascinating telescope possible. Yeah, so just a few words about uh, the IGER project. IGER is a near-cam GTO program that targets six quasars at redshift six-ish and above. So we get deep near-cam imaging as well as grism spectroscopy of the six crater fields. Well, this is just some basic information about the observations just for reference. And I would like to show you an example of the Iger image. And this is the field around Quasar J0100. And the Quasar is at the center of the field. And well, the image is just very beautiful. And in addition to this deep near-cam image, we also get uh, Grism spectroscopy of the whole field. So that essentially means we have spectrum for every object in this field. This excellent data set really allows us to do a lot of exciting science. So in the past year, there have been a series of Iger papers coming out. You can see they cover a wide range of topics. Uh, and in this talk, I'm going to focus on the recent paper by us, well, about high of quasar host galaxies. And I think, uh, in the previous talks, I mean, also previous sections, uh, there have been a lot of introduction about, you know, why we care about supermassive black holes and their host, uh, their coevolution with host galaxies. So just a brief recap, uh, this is the well-known black hole mass versus stellar mass relation for local galaxies. Uh, actually, I mean, this, this relation is a very important piece of evidence for the tight correlation between supermassive black holes and their host galaxies. And actually, there are still many, you know, open questions or mysteries about this relation. Say, what is the origin of this relation? And how does it evolve with redshift? Actually, characterizing the redshift evolution of the uh, black hole mass stellar mass relation is a pretty important way for us to understand how do supermassive black holes and their host galaxies co-evolve. So for example, uh, if, uh, I mean, as shown in this plot, uh, if supermassive black holes gain their mass prior to their host galaxies, we'll expect some evolutional track shown in the green line. And if things happen the other way around, we'll expect something shown in the blue line. So that means if we can somehow put uh, galaxies at different redshifts on this plot, uh, we're, we'll be able to, you know, distinguish different models of supermassive black hole growth and their coevolution with host galaxies. Uh, so to investigate this question, there have been many studies trying to put high redshift quasars, I mean redshift six quasars, on this plot. So as discussed in previous talks, what they found is that essentially those quasars have so-called so overmassive black holes compared to local relations. Oh, well, if this is the case, this result tells us maybe early supermassive black holes have experienced some very different growth histories compared to their low redshift counterparts. However, uh, there is a pretty key, cav I mean, key caveat in this kind of comparison. If we look carefully, I mean, this plot, uh, for local galaxies, we are showing the relation between black hole mass and stellar mass. And actually, in previous studies, we are, for high redshift quasars, what we are using is their dynamical mass instead of stellar mass. We actually didn't know their stellar mass. So the reason why we didn't know the stellar mass of high-redshift quasars is that we didn't have 
detections of their host galaxies in restroom uh, UV and optical. And that's further because quasars are so bright, they, they can be like 100 times brighter than their host galaxy, and the emission of their host galaxy just get overwhelmed by the bright quasars. Well, without the knowledge of the restroom UV and optical for the quasar host galaxies, there are many open questions about you know, high ratio supermassive black hole population. So first of all, as I said, we don't know what do the host gas look like in restroom UV and optical. And without the stellar mass, we cannot really say like what does the star, what is the black hole mass versus stellar mass relation look like at ratio six. Actually, we don't even know whether this relation even really exists at this kind of high redshift. And without the stellar mass, we cannot really say like whether those quasars do host overmassive black holes compared to local relation, or if they do, how much overmassive are those supermassive black holes? Well, to answer these questions, it is definitely uh, necessary for us to really see, to, to detect the quasar host galaxies in restroom UV and optical. And the basic method of this is the so-called PSF subtraction. So here we are utilizing the fact that the central engines of quasars are pretty compact and they appear to be PSFs in images, but their host galaxies are kind of extended. And that means if we can somehow model the PSF emission, I mean the emission from the central engine, the PSF component in this image of this bright quasar and subtract it from the image, we'll be able to see the diffused, the extended emission from the quasar host galaxy. Well, you can imagine the, the key points of this experiment is that we need deep imaging to see the diffuse emission, and we need a sharp PSF to really disentangle the emission from the central engine and the host galaxy. Uh, before the launch of STLST, there have been studies, uh, well, I should say ever since the discovery of high ratio quasars, there have been efforts trying to do this, this experiment. And most of these studies use HST, which is Already very powerful, but even with the power of HST, it is not really sufficient to, for to see, you know, the host galaxy of high redshift quasars. What we can get is essentially a bunch of uh, upper limits in the host galaxy flux. It is really until the launch of JST when we are able to see, you know, the host galaxy of those luminous quasars at redshift six. So just within one year, there have been many breakthroughs in this field. Uh, just a few examples, there have been near cam imaging program that shows the uh, stellar continuum of those crater host galaxies, as well as near spec IFU observations that detects the nebular emission lines of these crater host galaxies. And in this work, as I said, we are using the deep imaging from the IGER project to investigate the six quasars in our field and the properties are of their host galaxies. Well, there's one pretty critical, I would say critical advantage of IGER, and that is uh, every quasar in our sample is observed by four individual visits like this to cover the whole uh, field of view. And this setup does not only give us a better depth around the quasar, but also allow us to compare the output from different visits to, you know, convince ourselves that we do see the crater host galaxy because it's just so challenging so that this cross-validation is very important. Um, well, the analysis, as I said, is pretty straightforward. Uh, we first build PSF models using stars in the field and then run image feeding to get the fluxes of the crater host galaxies. And with the fluxes, we can do SD feeding to estimate their stellar masses. Well, I would say this is by no means an easy task, so, uh, but, Luckily, it works, and we do see these beautiful quasar host galaxies. Uh, so there are six quasars in the Iger sample, and we successfully see the host galaxies for three of them, and here are the three quasars. If you are wondering, like, what do they look like in the other bands, uh, this is what do they look like. So I think one, imp one pretty impressive point is, uh, to me at least, uh, all the quasar host galaxies look pretty consistent in all the three bands. That's, that's kind of a indication that we are, we are really seeing the emission from the host gas instead of some artifacts. Uh, and for the other three quasars, uh, although we are not able to really detect the host galaxy, we can set flux upper limits on you know, their host galaxies. And then with all these measurements, we can do 
Oh, sorry. We can do SEG fitting to get their standard mass estimates. And don't forget, we have Grism spectrum for all the quasars so that we can get the H beta line profile to estimate their black hole masses. And with all these, we are eventually able to come back to this plot, the black hole mass versus host mass, uh, standard mass plot, and put our quasars on this plot. And here is where, where do they locate. And we also include, you know, other measurements for what we have, what previous talks have mentioned, you know, there are a bunch of measurements for high redshift supermassive black hole from different AGNs, and also I include some local measurements. It might look a bit messy, but the point is all colored points here represents uh, black, hole mass, uh, black, black hole measurements for like high redshift AGNs and quasars. I think there's our, there are two key takeaways from this plot. First, for luminous quasars at redshift 6, they are pretty massive in, in terms of stellar mass. Uh, they have stellar masses like 10 to the 10 stellar mass ish or even more massive. This really makes them among the most massive galaxies at their redshifts. And the second thing is that we actually see the positive correlation between black hole masses and stellar masses at already. I mean, this relation exists at redshift 6. And also for high redshift quasars, uh, well, uh, as mentioned in previous talks, uh, they have pretty large black hole mass to star mass ratio, about 15% in our sample. But as discussed by Dale and Fabio, I mean, this, this, this comparison is subject to some selection effects, but that's something to keep in mind. Uh, just to bring my talk to the end, uh, I'm going to mention some future studies we are going to do. Uh, well, first, first of all, we want a better sample. By say a better sample, at the, I mean not only more quasars, but also uh, to understand the selection bias, selection effects of these quasar sample better. And we also want to do better measurements for individual quasars. That means we want to include like more imaging photometric, more photometric bands, and maybe include uh, emission line measurements from IFU. And that will not only give us better measurements of the stellar mass, but also allow us to measure other properties say like the star formation history and the metallicity, for example, of the critical host galaxies, that really will tell us a lot about how do these supermassive black holes co-evolve with their host galaxies. And here's my summary slide, just a f last few words. This is just the first year of JWST, and we already see so many fascinating results. And I believe we are in a new a golden era of understanding the most distant supermassive black holes, and we are like moving steadily towards our goal. Uh, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Oh, one there. Hi, um, Matthew Stone away from Peking University. So I have a question about the Galaxy SED model. Yes. In your fitting. Uh, yeah, in this slide, it looks like in the long field at 3.6 micron, the O3 emission line dominates the signal. So could you comment on the consistency between your SED model and the algorithm data? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. So for, first of all, that, that's why I mentioned I want to get the line, uh, emission line measurements because, well, with only imaging, I agree that we cannot like distinguish from the image that the emission, whether the emission comes from uh, the stellar continuum or uh, the emission lines. Uh, the grism, uh, I, I'm, well, I, we haven't really developed a tool to get the emission line from the host galaxy using our grism data yet. We are working on that. Uh, so, but now what we are doing is to just marginalize all the possible parameter space to like, okay, there's a possibility and that's included in our error bar. So that's why we have, still have a relatively large error bar. Uh, yeah, but that's definitely what we want to do in the future. Thank you. So this is a point that I think is also related to what uh, Mike Ball asked earlier. But uh, so for these really massive sources, do you have any idea how much obscuration you might expect of star formation and how that might <clears throat> affect things? Uh, is there any ALMA 
uh, imaging of any of these sources. I yep. you know dust is a very open question at these epochs, but um, you are in the most massive galaxies for some of these most massive ones. So, you know, is there any thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, we can go back to these images. Uh, for these quasar host galaxies, I, I think, I mean, let's, at least for to me, we do see some emission in like F200. That means it cannot be like really badly uh, obscured, but there, there can be some obscuration. And for ELMA, I think a few of the targets, at, at least to 1120, has, definitely has ELMA. And uh, yeah, um, but they, they, they kind of just look, I, I don't see like any existing evidence for like very, they, they are very badly obscured. They, there might, there must be some kind of attenuation for sure. And that's why we, again, want to get more photometric points. Uh, but, I mean, as far as I know, there is no, like, very bad uh, obscurations uh, evidence for that existing, but we can check. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, you can catch me how later. Uh, we need to move on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, next speaker is me, Michaela Hirschman. Um, are you ready to share the screen? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I'll share my screen. I'll try to give you two minutes warning. Yeah, perfect. You can see it well? It's good? Yeah. Oh, we did? Yes. It's 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 approaching asymptotically. <laughs> okay. Um. Just let me stop sharing again. Something is is going wrong here on my side. Um. And let me try again. Okay, now it should be fine? Yeah? Yes. Okay, excellent. We can see it now, so, thank you. Okay, great. So, um, hello everyone. So first I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present um, some of my work, even if just remotely. And so during my presentation, I would like to give you some insights into how we can model um, multi-component line emission of galaxies in cosmological simulations and to what extent this can help us with the interpretation of high redshift galaxy spectra from James Webb. So the starting point is, as we have already heard um, during this conference, that over the past um, year, thanks to different James Webb near spec surveys, we are now accumulating more and more high quality spectra for the first time now for large galaxy samples out to cosmic dawn. Here you can see three um, example spectra um, for galaxies above redshift seven from the Jade survey, where you can see these various uh, emission lines uh, emerging, um, which are very important because they can really provide us insights into uh, you know, ISM conditions and their ionizing sources at earliest cosmic epochs, but they are not always straightforward to interpret. So, for example, there have been some observational studies showing that emission line ratios of high redshift galaxies can be significantly elevated compared to their lower redshift counterparts, for example, in terms of O3 over O2 or also O3 over H beta, where it's unclear what's actually the related physical origin for these um, increased line ratios. Related to that, there have been also a few studies um, indicating or showing that relations between strong emission line ratios and um, the oxygen abundance of high redshift galaxies differ from classic metallicity calibrations, which are typically applied to low redshift galaxies, such that it's unclear of how we can reliably estimate metallicities um, from high redshift galaxy spectra, in particular when we are not having auroral lines detectable so that we cannot really get uh, metallicity via the um, reliable direct temperature method. Another, I think, big discovery so far from James Webb was, which has also been mentioned um, in previous talks, 
um, the unveiling the existence of a population of faint low mass AGN above redshift four or five ish, which, when actually put on the classic BPD diagnostic diagram, become indistinguishable from star forming galaxies, as we've heard. And now this raises the question how can we then robustly identify a population of type two AGN at high redshift where we are not necessarily having a strong AGN continuum contribution and also no um, broad component for their easy identification? So in general, for in the interpretation of emission lines, we can certainly use different SED fitting tools combined, for example, with large grids of photonization uh, models. But we have to keep in mind they're suffering from strong degeneracies due to their typically large free parameter space. So instead, in this talk, I would like to, you know, um, discuss an alternative way of how we can also interpret these high redshift emission lines, namely why I'm modeling them from in, in a cosmological context, so taking advantage of modern cosmological simulations. And so we've developed a method where we model line emission of cosmological simulations, basically by connecting them in post-processing to extensive pre-computed grids of emission line models, where we not just trace the line emission due to an ensemble of young star clusters in their H2 regions, but also um, due to other ionizing sources like post-AGB stellar populations, AGN, fast radiative shocks. And um, for the coupling, we actually match the free parameters of these photonization models to the quantities predicted in the simulation so that we can assign a synthetic spectrum to a simulated galaxy. So basically what we are effectively doing here is that we are reducing the large free parameter space to more physically motivated combinations within a cosmological context. And so we've applied this method to a number of different you know, cosmological simulations, galaxy formation models like illustrious TNG, the Santa Cruz SAM, we have, for example, contributed to the light cones um, dedicated or specifically made, constructed for the SEERS survey program. And we largely successfully validated our emission line predictions against observational data from redshift two, uh, zero up to redshift of two-ish so that we can be fairly confident to have a robust basis now allowing us to extend our emission line analysis out to higher redshift, so to have some comparison to an interpretation of new James Webb data. So to start with, let me show you here in the two panels um, on the right, the predicted O3 line luminosity function at redshift five and redshift six. You can see that TNG 50 and 100 um, predictions at redshift five nicely consistent with new James Webb data from the IGA survey. Um, only at redshift um, six at the faint end, we slightly start to underestimate O3, the census of O3 line imagers, but overall, I think given the purely theoretical um, nature of our modeling approach, we're doing a fairly good job in capturing the observed census um, of O3 line imagers at early cosmic epochs. So this is very motivating, so we can go a step further and we can now ask to what extent with our theoretical framework can we now also capture, you know, these observed extreme emission line ratio galaxies at high redshift, and if yes, what's their physical origin? So um, let me show you here a figure taken from a recent study of Seiji Fujimoto, basically showing um, O3 over o, um, H beta line ratios where's the stellar mass for galaxies above redshift uh, five from the Sears, but also other James Webb surveys shown by the various um, colored symbols. And what you can see is that on average, these line ratios are elevated compared to um, redshift two and lower redshift galaxy populations, in particular here for massive galaxies. And we can roughly reproduce these elevated line ratios with predictions from Santa Cruz SAM and illustrious TNG, as you see here by the green and blue shaded area. Even so, we have somewhat smaller scatter compared to the observations, where we, however, are also still um, suffering from low number statistics. But in a similar spirit, when we look at, for example, then also at the O3 over O2 line ratio, which is plotted here versus R23, we find that TNG is also predicting for galaxies above redshift five, um, significantly elevated line ratios compared to local SDSS populations. And these elevated line ratios seem to be also pretty consistent with um, James Webb data from the Sears and the, and the Chade survey, which are shown here by the pink symbols. And when exploring the origin of this, we find that in TNG, this seems to be um, strongly related, linked to an increased ionization parameter of high redshift galaxies governed by their specific star formation rates. And this basically implies 
you know, that the interstellar medium in high redshift galaxies seems to be hit by a stronger stellar ionizing radiation field, which increases the probability of getting doubly ionized oxygen ions also actually at the expenses of producing singly ionized oxygen ions, so that overall this ratio is um, increasing. But these are just first preliminary results, so we're still in the progress of actually exploring also um, the relative impact of a harder stellar ionizing radiation and Lyman continuum leakage on um, the evolution of these line ratios, basically by constructing and employing novel um, grids of photonization models. But these first results, um, from both theory and observations indicate that ionization conditions at high redshift are indeed different compared to low redshift. So the question is, what does this actually imply for classical metallicity calibrations and how can we then robustly estimate metallicities from high redshift spectra? So we have been addressing this point um, in our most recently published work. And here you can see just exemplarily for two line ratios, R3 and R23 their relation with the um, oxygen abundance as predicted from TNG from redshift zero up to redshift of seven, shown by the different um, colored lines. And you can clearly see that there's a fairly strong evolution of this, you know, relations up to redshift of four, not so much above. And this, this evolutionary trend um, is primarily related to a strong degeneracy of this line ratio with the ionization parameter at a given metallicity. And together with the fact that our simulations predict that the ionization parameter at a given metallicity is increasing from low to high redshift, basically explains, you know, this um, evolution of these um, relations. And encouragingly, when we now compare um, the, the, our, our relations for, for high redshift galaxies to some first direct temperature estimates for metallicities from, from new James Webb data, which is shown here, um, by, the, by the black symbols, then we find, I think, despite still low number statistics in the observations, a fairly good level um, of agreement, okay? And this motivated us um, to explicitly provide some fits to our predicted metallicity calibrations for galaxies above redshift four, which is indicated here by the red thick line together with the shaded area. And we did this exercise not just for these two, um, line ratios, but actually for many other optical and also UV line ratios, which are more or less um, tightly related with the oxygen abundance, which you can see here summarized um, on this slide. And one main point I would like to emphasize in this context is that I think one should be very careful with just applying classical metallicity calibrations um, to high redshift galaxies. This is certainly not a new point. But in our recent work, we explicitly showed that this can severely underestimate metallicities at a given stellar mass at high redshift. What you can also see here in these two panels, when you compare um, the black dashed lines, which actually show the line ratio derived metallicities at redshift four and redshift six. And if you compare that with the, with the blue and the, and the orange lines, um, they are actually, they illustrate the intrinsically predicted oxygen abundances from TNG at redshift four and redshift six. You can see there's a big difference, which in my opinion would be impeding a meaningful comparison between simulated and um, line ratio derived observed metallicities. Right? One minute and a half. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and um, so I think for really getting robust observational constraints, um, one, it can be useful to really forward model um, simulations into the observational space to compare apples to apples. And now over the last minute, I will just very quickly uh, come to my last point. How can we robustly identify type 2 AGN um, in, from high redshift um, galaxy spectra? And here I would like to start by saying that we're consistent with recent James Webb spectra that also with the simulations, we find that low mass high redshift AGN move more and more towards the star formation dominated regime in the BPD diagram, meaning classic BPD diagrams pretty much break down. And so to still robustly identify type 2 AGN in some previous works, we have been, you know, exploring different combinations of UV equivalent widths, UV emission line ratios. We came up with um, 10 different fairly well working UV diagnostic diagrams, which you can see here summarized on the slide, where you see again a nice separability emerging between the different galaxy types. And uh, 
We have also, um, in, in these previous works, we have been validating our selection criteria against different low and high redshift observational data, as you can see in this uh, panel down here. Pre-James Webb, now we have new data with James Webb, for example, um, which we can put onto these um, panels. For example, GNC Z11 is nicely falling onto the um, composite AGN area, as we would expect. And in this respect, so here we are also working on further novel um, UV diagnostics for um, AGN properties like their black hole accretion rates, their black hole accretion to star formation rate ratios, narrow line region properties like metallicities, ionization parameter, and so on. And so with that, I'm uh, concluding. So what I wanted to demonstrate during this talk is basically that we've been developing a uh, theoretical framework which allows us to trace the evolution of line emission from gas in, ga in galaxies exposed to different ionizing sources. And I think that this can be very helpful for the interpretation of high redshift James Webb spectra. And when combined, um, you know, when novel diagnostics, when combined with observations, then I think this can be a powerful tool to further constrain uncertain models for galaxy black hole growth in simulations, and so giving us deeper insights into um, early galaxy black hole evolution in our universe. So I'll stop here. Um, thank, you. thank you, and I'm happy to take some questions. Questions? Uh, I don't. Hi, Michaela, it's Mirko Kurti here. Thanks for the beautiful talk. I'm just wondering if uh, you have estimated what is the impact of, for instance, on the uh, inferred slope of the mass metallicity relation if you use your new calibrated, theoretically based um, diagnostics compared to the standard strong line based diagnostics that have been used in the last 10 years or so. Yeah. So. Um... Basically, when we, when we use the new um, metallicity diagnostics, um, which we inferred from the simulations, what we basically get is um, our higher metallicities at a given stellar mass at high redshift, in particular for more massive galaxies. So, I mean, it depends really also on the, on the classic metallicity tracer you use, but in general, I would say that you get um, a more steepened um, um, mass metallicity relation at high redshift. So, yeah, I think that's that's probably uh, the main the main uh, the main modification. But again, I mean, you can look at at our paper, and there you will see the differences for the different um, classic uh, metal line uh, metallicity tracers. But I would say, in general, it's like really steepening um, the mass metallicity relation. Thank you. We are unfortunately we are running late, so we need to move on. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So the next speaker is Annalise Evans, and uh, she has the floor. Okay. Hi, I'm Annalise Evans. Thank you for having me here for a talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about building semi-analytic black hole seeding models using illustrious TNG host galaxies that I've been working on with, with Laura Blecka and Aquan Bomek.
So as we heard in the talks before, because black holes grew to billions of solar masses in less than a gig year of cosmic time, this naturally poses stringent constraints on black hole formation and growth models. And we've heard of all these uh, different seeding scenarios where the earliest um, population three stellar remnants would have had to have undergone super Eddington accretion rates to achieve such massive sizes, as well as the direct collapse scenario being promising in the sense of forming heavy seeds, but it's still highly debated um, how to um, sustain these pristine gas clouds for long enough periods of time. And currently, observational constraints on AGN number density evolution are increasingly uncertain up to redshift six and especially past that. And luckily, um, JWST has pushed our knowledge when it comes to um, reconsidering black hole growth, um, as we heard earlier with this Larson et al. 2023 study. Um, because uh, before we, before its launch, we knew of all these greater than 10 to the ninth solar mass black holes um, around redshift six through seven. But now that um, JWST has observed these seeds that are closer to the seed mass, um, this is good um, because uh, um, with this study, they highlighted that with the direct collapse scenario that they would require at least adding to accretion rates. So I'd like to highlight the gravitational wave detection facilities um, that are important for um, this work with the models that we're building. Um, the Pulsar Timing Array Collaboration, which detects gravitational waves from um, black hole binaries within our local universe. And then the laser interferometer space antenna um, detecting in a lower mass regime. And on the right um, is pictured merger event predictions from um, dwarf galaxies from a cosmological simulation with the total mass ratios given as a function of redshift and their signal to noise ratios. And so we're utilizing TNG 50, the smallest resolution, um, sorry, the highest resolution, smallest volume box. And here is showing um, the evolution of an average galaxy within TNG. It's cos a cosmological simulation with magneto hydrodynamics and, and body gravitational physics. Overall, it models um, galaxy formation and evolution well, as well as the black hole scaling relations. And the um, subgrid physics models pertaining to black holes are that they grow via bondi hoyle accretion and accrete with um, thermal versus radial modes of feedback. Um, and they have a simple seeding prescription where they seed a roughly 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole once the halo mass reaches a threshold. And so on building the SAMs, they're um, motivated by basic principles of black hole formation theory, um, that the black holes are expected to be seeded in massive metal poor galaxies. And um, so they are hybrid and they're post-processing. And because they're post-processing, that makes them computationally inexpensive um, compared to running a full cosmological simulation with a set of initial conditions. And they allow us to explore seeding criteria that are more lenient than um, the TNG, than in TNG. And we can vary these uh, different seeding parameters um, to choose galaxy populations where we're seeding black holes. And we're making a rough assumption of one black hole per host. And we have we implement these minimum total and gas mass criteria, as well as the maximum metallicity criteria, and seed 1% um, of galaxies at each snapshot as a probabilistic seeding fraction model in order to um, account for any physics that we're not looking at in the models. So here is um, picturing the most lenient mass cut 
um, model that we looked at. And um, so separating the full population from with all the black holes versus just the ones with only um, greater than 10 to the fifth solar masses, since those are comparable to um, number density evolution results from AGN observations. Um, for this model, it's showing that the, um, the black holes that are less heavy below 10 to the fifth solar masses are making um, dominant contributions, especially at high redshifts. And interestingly, um, the, the different metallicity model results are coming in agreement for this um, lenient mass cut model. And then showing the mass density evolution results for the same a lenient mass cut on the previous slide, it's showing that above um, redshift seven, the primary mass density contributions are coming from the, um, the less heavy black holes below 10 to the fifth solar masses. So that underscores the importance of LISA to be able to detect these um, gravitational waves um, from their mergers. And um, below redshift four, it's the models are under predicting with respect to TNG, um, which is as expected um, since we're seeding in lower mass hosts. Um, and also the, um, the growth model that's implemented here is a, a simple fraction of um, the total stellar mass in the host galaxies. Um, it's assumed to be the mass of the black hole, and this is a rough estimate. Um, and it's taken from the scaling relation from McConnell and Ma 2013. And here we're implementing a, a strict total mass cut, um, and it's showing how when we make the cut stricter, then the black hole seeding sites then become restricted and the lowest metallicity models struggle to produce uh, black holes early enough. Um, overall, several of the SAMs are producing realistic black hole populations, and notably with this strict cut, the, um, the less heavy black hole seeds are still making significant contributions. And when we look at the black hole mass function, the knee is lower than that from observations and TNG, but it is coming close to TNG above 10 to the ninth solar masses. And as expected with the scaling relation model that we're using, the lower metallicity models will under predict with respect to the um, other models at the lower black hole mass N. But overall, TNG reproduces a, a good um, black hole scaling relation as well as cosmic star formation rate density. So to conclude, several of the SAMs produce realistic black hole populations. When the host mass cuts are strict, this restricts the black hole seeding sites and prevents them from seeding black holes early enough. Versus when they're lenient, um, the uh, model results at high redshifts um, show that the black holes that are less than 10 to the fifth solar masses are going to be prime targets for LISA. So for future directions, we want to interpret JWST observations, inform black hole formation models in future simulations, incorporate a binary in spiral model to make gravitational wave predictions. And that's all. Thank you. Questions or analysis? Just wondering about the relationship between the black hole mass and the galaxy mass. It comes out of your simulations. Observations seem to show that that relationship is tighter for spheroids than it is for whole galaxies. And I wonder if you find the same thing in your simulations. And also, the um, ratio of black hole mass the galaxy mass or spheroid mass, that coefficient, I'm going, wondering what that depends on, which of your seed 
parameters that telling us most about? Um, for your question on um, the whether they're um, spheroids or um, the shape of the galaxies is different. Um, we haven't studied extensively the um, host uh, properties that um, come with the um, where the black holes are being seeded. Um, but with the scaling relation, um, just to make sure I answer your question properly, are you asking how we um, made the black hole mass estimates? A proportionality between black hole mass, what C mass? And I'm just wondering what that proportionality number depends on most in your models. So is it the initial seed masses of the black holes? What, what seed properties does that number most depend on? Um, the black hole mass in our models depends on the stellar mass. Um, we take a fraction of the total stellar mass um, to make those black hole mass estimates. Um, it sounds okay. like, yeah, this is a good discussion for, for the lunch break. And is there any other question? If not, let's thank Annalise again. Kurti, Okay, so I hope you can hear me well. Uh, my name is Mirko Hurt. I'm an ISO fellow in Gaki in Germany. And I, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity of being here and presenting some of the first results about the evolution of the Middle East properties of galaxies as unveiled by GWST in the past year. So to put things a little bit into context first, why do we care about studying gas space metallicity? Well, it is actually one of the most key parameters for galaxy evolution studies because it's basically sensitive to all the processes driving, driving the barium uh, cycle in galaxies. And the interplay of all these processes is clearly seen in the existence of scaling relations between metallicity and other galaxy properties. And the most uh, thoroughly studied in the past 20 years is probably the mass metallicity relation, which is the relationship between the stellar mass in galaxies and the gas phase metallicity. And the properties of this relation are sensitive to many different physical properties, for instance, the stellar yield, or for instance, the low mass uh, the slope of the low mass end of the relation is sensitive to the uh, metal looping factor of outflows driven by star formation. Um, another key observational uh, result of the past 20 years is that the scattering this mass metal east relation correlates with different physical properties, and the most striking um, correlation is with the star formation rate, in the sense that as fixed star mass, high star formation rate galaxies appear to be less metal rich than uh, low star formation rate galaxies. And this has been interpreted as the existence of a more fundamental relation in the 3D space that by stellar mass, star formation rate, and metallicity, which has been dubbed the fundamental metallicity relation, such that the mass metallicity relation that we just see is just a projection, a 2D projection of a more fundamental relation in this 3D space. Now, to study metallicity in galaxies, we usually have to rely on these beautiful uh, emission line spectra from H2 regions, which contains several uh, emission lines, both from hydrogen recombination lines and forbidden lines. And there has been extensive work in the last decade to try to characterize the evolution of the metallicity scaling relation from the ground, but that was possible only to up to a redshift of around three, where those uh, diagnostics in the rest frame optical were to be observed in the near infrared from the ground. And overall, the picture that has emerged is that the mass metallicity relation evolves with redshifts in the sense that at fixed stellar mass, high redshift galaxies are less enriched than their local counterparts. But when you bring uh, everything into the FMR framework, so accounting for the secondary dependence on the star formation rate, uh, high redshift galaxies at up to redshift about three, on average, follow the same local scale relation as predicted by the uh, local fundamental metallicity relation. 
But then uh, JWST came on Sky, and it really revolutionized our, the possibility of studying the metallicity properties of galaxies at high redshift. And it did that from the very beginning. So from the very first observations, uh, year observation of this max 0723 uh, cluster, we have been accessing immediately to the rest frame optical lines for uh, galaxies up to the redshift of eight, and not only the most strong emission lines, but also the faint emission lines like the oxygen 34363, which is a really a key uh, diagnostics for electron temperature that can be used to derive more physically motivated measurements of the gas phase metallicity. And so what have we have been trying to do in the last uh, few months was to, for instance, leverage some of the deepest observations that we got in the, uh, within the JATES collaboration. And here I'm showing some of the spectra that we get from PRISM uh, observations of um, uh, JATES galaxies in the uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field in Good South to try to characterize the ISM and metallicity properties of galaxies up to the highest redshift probe by JWST. And one of the main, uh, one of the first results, this is a paper um, led by Alex Cameron, is that we could start uh, characterizing the uh, emission line ratios properties of these galaxies by plotting the JATES galaxies into the uh, typical uh, strong line diagnostics like the O32 versus R23, which are sensitive to both ionization, excitation, and metallicity. And we see that high redshift galaxies brought by JWST are distributed uh, along, but even beyond the tail of uh, local galaxies here as, um, as probed by SDSS, but also uh, galaxies at redshift 2. Another key result, which was already discussed earlier today, is that the standard diagnostic diagrams like the DPT diagrams, which include nitrogen lines, are becoming less and less useful to characterize the excitation properties and the ionization properties of these galaxies. On, on the one hand, because we barely detect nitrogen 2 even in our deepest observations in JACE, so we can only place upper limits, which are not very meaningful here, but also because, as we, as we have seen extensively before, uh, low metallicity AGNs are all shifted into the star forming region, so the classification of between star formation and AGN uh, ionization as based on the BPT diagrams has to be uh, completely revisited. But nonetheless, there has been uh, extensive work trying to um, translate the emission line ratios that we observe with JWST into metallicity and so study the evolution of the Middle East scale relation uh, redshifts above three. So these are some of the papers that came out in the last uh, year. There are also probably many more. And what we have been trying to do in a paper that was published, um, well, was submitted actually a few months ago and is still under review, uh, we have tried to complement our uh, deepest uh, observations uh, that we had with, uh, with in Jades that probe the low mass end of the of the mass metal relation, and in particular of the stellar mass transformation rate plane here, with observation from the literature, in particular the samples from Sears as presented by Kimiko Nakajima and collaborators, and try to assess the evolution of the mass metal relation at redshift above three uh, across um, uh, three orders of magnitude in stellar mass. And so this is the mass metal relation that we found uh, redshift between three and 10. So there are, I would say, two take home messages here. One is that we found only a mild evolution in the normalization of the uh, uh, median uh, mass metal east relation compared to previous realization of the same scale relation at redshift of three. And this is general milder than what it would be predicted by classical gas regulator models. If you fix all the other parameters and you just evolve, for instance, the gas fraction, you would predict uh, um, a higher evolution in the normalization that we observe. The other thing is that we find evidence for a flattening of the slope at the low mass end of the mass metal isolation compared to what is seen both in the local universe and at redshift up to three at higher masses. Interestingly, the um, average mass metal isolation that we measure at redshift between three and 10 is very well um, reproduced by uh, local galaxies, local extreme line emitters like blueberry and green pea galaxies that has been for a long time a study as potential um, uh, analogs of high redshift galaxies in the local universe. And in terms of simulations and mo modulo all the uh, caveats and uncertainties that also Michaela Ishman has discussed before, uh, most simulations at redshift around uh, six and eight predicts generally steeper mass metallicity relation at lower masses than we observe. And in general, um, analytical and semi-analytical um, chemical evolution models that implement momentum-driven star formation, momentum-driven uh, winds from uh, star formation and supernovae, uh, better reproduce the observed slope of the mass metallicity relation in the sense that they predict uh, flatter slope than energy-driven uh, winds. 
uh, but what happens if we bring star formation rate into, into play, so we report everything into the FMR framework, well, we are actually starting to see uh, evidence for deviation from the prediction of the local middle east relation, uh, of the local fundamental middle east relation at redshift above three. And this is actually becoming more and more prominent with redshift. And this is correlating also very well with the specific star formation, or with the average specific star formation rate of these galaxies, which might be another indirect indication for stochasticity of the star formation history in the sense that if uh, the um, uh, stochastic episode of gas accretion and star formation occurs on time scales which are much shorter than what is needed for these galaxies to enrich and bring back to the equilibrium as described by the FMR, this might appear less enriched than predicted by the local fundamental medicine given their stellar mass and star formation rate. Okay, uh, but there are a few caveats here that has to be taken into uh, account. Uh, one, of course, first is what star formation rate calibration are you using here? And uh, ideally, one should use star formation rate calibrations to convert the initial line fluxes like H alpha to star formation rate, uh, which are more better uh, suited for low metallicity galaxies rather than for solar metallicities. Then, of course, there are different parameterization of the FMR at low masses and high star formation rate. And then there's the uh, usual uh, uh, problems with the metallicity calibrations, which is, are we happy in the way in which we are measuring metallicities in these galaxies from emission line ratios? And that has been discussed by Michaela before. There has been a uh, lot of tons of evidence of the fact that these metallicities, strong line metallicity calibrations evolves with redshifts. And there has been extensive work in the past trying to uh, provide uh, calibrations which are suitable for the high redshift universe, for example, between, uh, from uh, Kimiko Nakajima or Ryan Sanders. And in this sense, I would like to briefly highlight the work led by Isaac Lasseter and the Jades collaboration in which we have uh, investigated auroral lines detections in Jades and try to characterize and study the evolution of the metallicity scanning relations at high redshift. Uh, sorry, of the metallicity calibrations at high redshift. In this sense, one result which is interesting is that if you see, if you look at the detections of the uh, oxygen 3, 43, 63 or line, you derive the metallicity, and you plot that on the standard strong line diagnostics, you see that the plateau of these calibrations, which are intrinsically double valued, are starting to get flatter and flatter as we go to higher redshift, which means that at fixed line ratio, we are less and less sensitive to the metallicity. Thank you. And so we've tried in this paper to provide a new uh, different calibrators, which is basically a, just a different reprojection of the standard R23. And we tested it against the observations from Jades and Sears, finding a reasonably good agreement as we have implemented these uh, calibrators to derive the mass metallicity relation that I've shown just before. But of course, it would be good to increase the sample size of our all line detections at high redshift to better probe the, the, the metallicity parameter space and better try to characterize the evolution of the strong line diagnostics. And in this sense, there has been several uh, programs observed, well, approved and, and observed in cycle one to exactly do this. And for instance, recently, uh, Alison Strom has uh, published uh, the first uh, stacked spectrum from the Cecilia program, revealing a plateau of beautiful uh, faint emission lines. And we have also been leading a um, similar program in spirit in cycle one, which we have dubbed uh, measuring abundances at high redshift with a T approach, or the MARTA survey, if you prefer, and which leveraged the extremely deep MSA pointing of around 100 of galaxies at the cosmic noon, to try to characterize the metallicity properties of these galaxies with T method. And this is where our pointing, MSA pointing lie in the context of, for instance, the Cosmic Web uh, observations. And we have tried to select, assemble a sample which spans a wide range in stellar mass and star formation rate at these epochs. And we have observed these galaxies in three different configurations. One extremely deep observation in G140M, complemented by relatively shallower, but still, relatively deep <laughs> observations in uh, band two in both uh, medium and high resolution um, uh, configurations uh, to provide not only T-based metallicity measurements, but also characterize in detail ionization condition, density, dust properties, and even the presence of outflows from the, our high resolution observations. And finally, I'm very happy, this is a simulated spectrum that I've been showing several times at conferences in the past, I'm happy to throw it away and finally show some real spectra that we just got a couple of months ago this is a galaxy at redshift 2.2 uh, observed in band one, 32 hours, and band two, seven hours. And you can see a lot of emission lines, and in particular, 
the oxygen-3, 4363 is clearly detected above the continuum. But in this specific galaxy, not only we detect these auroral lines, but also several other auroral lines. The sulfur-2 auroral lines, that's 4069 angstrom, and also the uh, oxygen-2 auroral line in band 2 at 7330 angstrom, and also the sulfur-3 auroral line. So this means that we can not only derive um, accurate chemical abundances in these galaxies, but also trying to, for the first time, characterize in detail the ionization structure of H2 regions in these galaxies and testing the, reali the reliability of the T method in these, in these sources. For instance, by studying the temperature-temperature relations as temperatures derived by different, by means of different auroral lines, and this is an example how, where this galaxy redshift 2.2 falls on different temperature-temperature relations compared to local galaxies and H2 regions. And I conclude by saying we can only also study chemical abundance patterns, for instance, uh, neon, argon, and nitrogen, which are sensitive to the different star formation history in galaxies. And I'll just leave with my conclusion and summary slide, and thank you very much for your attention. Time for an urgent half a question. Any taker? If not, let's thank Mirko again. And now we have the, the super fast poster session. If okay, if, if speakers can line up, and uh, I think uh, it's easier with this. Yeah. <sighs> Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Meredith Stone. I'm a PhD student at Arizona, advised by uh, George Rieke in the MIRI group there. And today I'm going to be sharing some results from our Cycle 1 GTO program to detect the host galaxies of a few uh, high redshift quasars with near cam imaging. So, because these are dedicated observations and we're not pulling from some larger field or survey, uh, we don't have a lot of stars in our images to build an empirical PSF. So, instead, for each quasar, we obtain dedicated observations of a PSF star which we then take as a reference and subtract from our quasar. And these stellar and quasar PSFs match each other really well. We do a really good do job minimizing the PSF artifacts, partially because of our use of near-cam medium bands, which, when compared to wide bands, do a better job of mitigating any differences in the shape of the stellar and quasar PSFs due to the di di their different uh, spectral shapes. So over here, we have a couple of our quasars. J2239 is a slightly less luminous quasar, and it has a whopping ALMA dynamical mass so we expected detecting this host galaxy to be a walk in the park, which it was not. Uh, we did detect it in two of the three bands uh, that we observed it in, but only at about the five to seven sigma level. So it's much fainter, much less massive than we expected. And as it turns out, uh, the stellar mass of this quasar is uh, more than an order of magnitude less than its dynamical mass. So it's a super interesting object. It was just published in AppJ last month. Uh, our other four quasars are still sort of preliminary, uh, but so far we're not really detecting any other host galaxies. I've popped one of them up here. This is J1120. You see it's sort of missing that extended fuzz that we see around J2239. But this is not the entire story because J1120 is one of the Iger quasars you just heard about, and that group, using near-cam wide bands, did detect a galaxy associated with this quasar. So we're really honing in on the optimal method of measuring these things. So these points might move around a little bit as we refine our analysis. So far, it really seems like they're all lying away from the Megorian relation. And while this isn't necessarily the greatest sample to say absolutely the Megorian relation evolves with cosmic time, I do think it's safe to say at this point that it exhibits greater scatter than it does locally, which just on its own is super fascinating, has really interesting implications for the growth of supermassive black holes and their host galaxies early in the universe. Thanks so much. Chris and Lisa.
Oh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Lulu Zhang, um, the new postdoc at the U UT uh, San Antonio and uh, a member of the GATS collaboration. After getting my PhD degree uh, this July from Peking University, <coughs> my uh, study focusing on the spatially result, the uh, mid infrared uh, spectral diagnostics in nearby galaxies, as, in, as exampled here. And uh, uh, in this uh, case study, as summarized here, we combined the um, mid infrared diagnostics obtained from the MIRI MIS uh, uh, IFU observations and also the code gas information uh, obtained from the IMA observations to study the special result um, star formation rate and the star formation efficiency within the central region of NGC 7469 on 100PC scale. Um, we find, uh, we find uh, out that as shown in the middle, uh, the star formation rate distribution of this target is uh, very prominent um, on the circumnuclear ring-like structure while the cold gas is piling up toward the nucleus and uh, uh, correspondingly we um, find that there is a minimum of the star formation efficiency at the nucleus and uh, we find a, cons a, co a consistent distribution of the Tommy Q parameter. So um, uh, to explain, uh, and then we figure, figure, figure out in the top right that uh, such, um, such uh, relatively depressed the star, formation, star, uh, star formation efficiency is highly associated with uh, aging activity uh, which works by um, uh, driving some mechanism of gas heating and uh, uh, triggering um, triggering um, the processes of uh, uh, outflowing uh, gas outflowing, um, and uh, now we are actively working within the gas uh, collaboration uh, uh, with the, with the close eye on the launching side of the aging outflows. Our aging sample here uh, ha having. Um, Similar distance and the luminosity spot covering a large aging outflow rates, it provides us a uh, optical, uh, ideal opportunity to decipher how the aging outflows is driving and uh, uh, the potential effects of aging feedback. That's all. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Mason Ruby from the University of Memphis. I'm working with, I'm a grad student working with uh, Francisco Mio Sanchez. Uh, so we're presenting uh, near spec results for uh, the C41 for Galaxy NGC 4151. Um, so the main things here, um, for one, we're, we're showing the flux velocity and dispersion maps of Silicon 7. This is a new line that JDOST allows us to work with. Um, the results are consistent with previous um, OSIRIS results um, obtained using the Silicon 6 line. We have a ionized outflow uh, here. The new results, however, that Osiris was not able to reveal is um, in the warm molecular gas, we have uh, a mole molecular gas outflow that's uh, highly correlated with the silicon seven line. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we're detecting what we believe is the uh, warm molecular gas torus around the AGN um, with scales ranging from uh, point, or 25 to 75 parsecs. Um, and then also in the kinematics of the warm molecular gas are dominated by the outflow rather than rotation. So thank you very much. I'll be outside if you'd like to talk. Uh, is Mazafuza? Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Masa Sanoue. I'm a, a Kabri Astrophysics Fellow from the Peking University. So here in this poster, I'm presenting our ongoing efforts to observe 12 of the very faint quasars from the Subaru Hyper-Supran Camp Survey. So here in the left panel, I'm showing our first, pap our first paper in which we observed two of the uh, very faint quasars at higher shift. So here I'm basically showing our uh, first starlight detection from the two, two quasars. Uh, and uh, based on our acidity analysis, we inferred that these two quasars post are very massive with the stellar masses of around 10 to the 11 solar mass. So in the middle panel, I'm showing 
that not only we detected the host galaxy, but also uh, for the first quasar in the REFS panel, we also detected the host galaxy in the spectroscopic data in the REFS frame optical. So here I'm showing the um, near spec uh, mid, uh, mid resolution uh, data. And so here you can see that, uh, well, we detected the H alpha and H beta as emission, but also, but also we detected the higher order H gamma delta and A epsilon as absorption line. So this is a very clear signature that this uh, quasar host galaxy has a post starburst galaxy feature. So in the um, middle panel, uh, at the bottom of the middle panel, I'm showing the recovered uh, star formation history of this galaxy. So basically, uh, this host galaxy experienced one starburst event roughly 200 million years ago before this quasar was observed. In the right panel, I'm showing the um, observed stellar mass and the black hole mass ratio. So basically, well, as far as our targets are concerned, basically our targets are, are consistent with the local scaling relationship after uh, taking into account the uh, luminosity bias in the sample selection and also the systematic uncertainty in the black hole mass and stellar mass measurement. So please come to my poster or send comments to my other Slack channel. Thank you. You can unmute if you're online. Hello. Here. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I think we can yes, hear we you can. a little yeah. faint, but. Yeah, hi. I'm Xinjiang Zhen. I'm a grad student at UT Austin working at Walker Braun and Steve Finkelstein. So we have many high resolution university aging observations that have seen previous talks, and we wanted to test more low luminous and low mass gas and black agents at more lower mass halos as the agents we've observed so far are probably the more massive and the more luminous AGNs at the high resolution universe. So we run the cosmic simulation, answer the black hole as soon after the first stars form and follow its growth. Figure one on the right shows the black hole masses at the fashion at the bottom. And the halo properties of the black hole where the black hole resides in the blue and yellow lines. And we see that compared to observations, they are much lower in mass, which, uh, which aligns our goal of simulating much more common lower mass halos and AGNs. We also see in figure one that the black hole masses don't evolve uh, a lot. They don't really seem to grow. And the reason, reason behind we believe is that because of stellar feedback, as seen in figure two, and the temperature density plot of the halo and the, and the cosmic simulation, that the temperature in there is generally high, probably due to, due to stellar feedback, and the stellar feedback in the gas has a hard time accreting onto the black hole. And even without stellar feedback, in figures three, we zoom in more near the halo center, and it shows the AGN that, want, that is wandering away from the gas, uh, maximum gas density. From, as it, we believe that the lower mass black hole has a harder time sinking into the central density of the lower mass halo, the lower gravity, of the lower gravitational potential of the halo, and the dynamical friction not having a, as large of an effect on the lower mass AGN. Due to that, on figure four in the bottom right, so the fluxes produced by these AGNs and jagged lines, which are generally much lower than the AGN sensitivity. So these low mass seeds are ex expected to be unobservable over the JWST, which agrees with the previous talk, one of the previous talks as well. We, for the AGNs to be observable, they would be accreted at much higher, rate, higher accretion rates, such as Eddington, as seen the dot dashed lines, or maybe a much heavier seed like DCBH in the black lines. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Aklant Kumar Bhomik and I'm a postdoc at University of Florida. And my poster basically presents a new suite of cosmological hydrodynamic simulations, uh, namely the Brahma simulations, which are particularly geared for predicting observational signatures of low mass black hole seed models um, at high redshifts. And uh, one of the long standing challenges of cosmological simulations is the ability to represent low mass seeds, largely due to resolution limitations. But uh, we designed our simulation suite to particularly tackle this challenge by using multiple simulation boxes, three boxes, with successively increasing volumes by factors of eight. And in the smallest of this box, we explicitly resolve 10 to the power three solar mass seeds that are made to form in the star forming and metal pore gas environments representative of population three seeding environments. And then we use the results of the smallest volume simulation to calibrate and build new seed models for larger volume simulations like 12.5 megaparsecs and 25 megaparsecs, so that they too can make predictions for these low mass seeding models with much better statistical power without having to explicitly resolve these seeds. So amongst all these, so before that, um, 
Uh, so we explored a wide range of seed models, which differ from each other in terms of the total amount of star-forming metal poor gas mass that can be converted to a black hole seed. And amongst all these observables, I'm just going to focus on uh, one of the plots, which is the top panel of um, the middle plot, so the redshift 7 stellar mass black hole mass relations, where the colored points show the simulation predictions, and the black dots show the JWST measurements taken from Fabio's paper. And we can see that in, for the least restrictive of our seed models, we see that the simulation predictions broadly produce consistent results with the JWST measurements. But as we make the seed models more and more restrictive, we see that the black hole masses are starting to get underestimated compared to the JWST measurements. All this is to say that, of course, we are very excited about heavy mass seeds from all these measurements, but it is not impossible for low mass seeds to also produce uh, the JWST AGNs, provided that they form in enough numbers and second, they merge efficiently enough. Thank you. If you want to discuss more details about this or all the other observables that we predict, feel free to stop by my poster at 3 o'clock. Thank you very much. Yeah, let's thank, let's thank all the speakers and uh, reconvene at 1.30 sharp, please.